Welcome to your first lecture on jurisprudence, legal positivism, and John Austin in particular. Today, we will be going over the introduction to legal positivism and John Austin's model. We will then subsequently begin to explore the internal aspect of law, as presented by Hart. Thirdly, we will move to primary texts like the concept of law, which contains H.L.A. Hart's criticism of Austin's theory. And lastly, we will, we will merge Hart's criticism with the criticism of theorists like Cottrell, where, who in his book, Politics of Jurisprudence, especially chapter 3 and 4, ended up defending Austin. So let's begin by describing what legal positivism is. Legal positivism is the doctrine about the nature of law, according to which a. All laws are laid down by a person or a procedure, and b. Something counts as a valid law of a certain system in virtue of being laid down by a certain someone or according to a certain procedure. In other words, the legal validity of a rule depends on its sources, where has it come from, how and when, rather than its merits, whether it is a good rule or a bad rule. So, um, legal positivism does not concern itself with whether something is morally good or morally bad. It only concerns itself with where the law has come from. That is what legal positivism is about. Now, this way of understanding the law was also made famous during the 19th century by the command theories of law, which were presented by Jeremy Bentham and John Austin. Now, according to these theories, positive law or law so-called is the command of the sovereign, which is backed up by the threat of a sanction in the case of non-compliance to which people show habitual obedience. Now, these command theories help us to understand the positive nature of law, allow us to identify and understand what law is before considering whether it is morally good or morally bad and foreground the role which coercion plays in the law and so furnishes us with a legal theory which attempts to tell citizens subject to the law exactly the sort of thing they are dealing with. However, unfortunately, the command, theories make, the command theory makes it difficult to understand how legal systems work as a system. Each law is law because it is posited by an act of the sovereign and so each law appears to be self-contained and self-sufficient, unified only in that all laws have in fact been commanded by the present sovereign. This, however, fails to explain the way in which legal systems seem to have, well, a life of their own independently of the lives of the sovereign or legislatures which posit the laws. Legal systems remain in force and are capable of altering the laws which comprise them, are capable of creating laws across time, and even they retain these characteristics when, for example, one sovereign dies or one legislature dissolves and a new one ascends to the throne or is reconvened. Now, the 20th century legal theorists like H.L.A. Hart and Hans Kelsen both criticized these weaknesses in Austin's command theory of law and in their own separate ways set out to explain what law is, what is, what is it rather that unifies laws into legal systems and allows legal systems to regulate their own creation, have a life of their own. So we saw previously how both Hart and Kelson uh, tried to improve upon Austin's model by saying that Austin's model fails to describe how legal systems happen to have a life of their own. Another important way in which both Hart and Kelson tried to improve upon Austin's legal positivism was to give a better account of law's internal aspect. Austin presented those who were subject to the law as being passive in the face of an external force. Law was the command of the sovereign, which was backed up by the sanctions, in the face of which the population had a habit of obedience. They were passive. In Hart's view, this account of law only explained how law looked on the surface and from the outside and was similar to an account of cars stopping at traffic lights such as a Martian sociologist might offer. A Martian sociologist could state that cars have a habit of stopping in the face of traffic lights turning red. This way of looking at the situation, however, fails to tell us how things appear from the inside to those who use legal rules to guide their conducts in their daily lives. Cars do not merely happen to have a habit of stopping at red lights. Rather, those people in the cars understand that there is a rule requiring them to stop, which they are using to guide their conduct and which they take as a reason for stopping when the traffic 
traffic light turns red. The point which Hart wanted to make was that legal theorists will miss some of the most important things about the nature of law unless they understand law as it is understood by those who are subject to it and use it as a guide to conduct. Hart dubbed this the insider's perspective, the internal aspect of law, and insisted that law had to be understood, taking into account this internal point of view if it, if it was to be understood adequately. Now, Hart and Kelsen gave different accounts of this internal aspect of law, but both wanted to stop short of turning it into an intrinsically moral aspect, which would cast doubt on their legal positivism. According to Hart and Kelsen, then legal theorists must understand law from the internal point of view, but that point of view must not be so internal so as to entail a moral endorsement of law. We will now be going over Hart's criticism of Austin's model, uh, which he uh, went over quite elaborately between chapters 1 to 7 and in the preface. Now, Hart said that Austin defined uh, law by the command model, that is, laws are just orders backed by the threats or habits issued by a person institution that is generally obeyed. Now, when defining legal controls, orders from officials cannot be the primary way the law functions, According to Hart, the law doesn't function primarily by officials going around and telling everyone of every single act that they are required to do. No state would have the resources to do this. The officials do communicate the rules to the individuals. According to Hart, it is the exception. Normally, laws are made by general forms of directions. For example, statutes. Therefore, legal control is primarily controlled by directions that apply to general classes of people and prescribe general types of behavior. The party issuing the order must be habitually obeyed by the population and there has to be a belief that the sanctions for non-compliance will be effected. Now, Cottrell responded to this criticism of Hart towards Austin and he stated that Austin and Bentham both require a generality for a law to exist. Generality relates, one, to the category of addressees and two, to the acts prohibited required by the rule. That is not merely a direction on one specific case or action, nor to a particular individual. Austin therefore sees a law as a technical instrument that could aim for utility, not as a device to maximize liberty. Now, Hart also lists several other objections to Austin's point of view. These are categorized in content, mode of origin, and the range of application of law's argument. We will briefly go over the con content argument. Now, Hart believed that while criminal law and tort law do bear an ana analogy to the command model, many areas of law do not. Rules that confer po legal powers on people, example by allowing them to contract and giving effect to their contracts, or the power to make a will, is not demanding any particular type of behavior, and there is no sanction involved. Some try to get around this objection by associating power-conferring rules with coercive rules, by suggesting that nullity is the sanction resulting from non-compliance with the rule. Hart denies this, saying that it makes no sense to speak of nullity as a sanction since power-conferring rules are not trying to suppress a type of behavior, but instead are setting limits to the power conferred. For example, the rule that only a majority vote in the parliament will allow a bill to pass cannot be regarded as punishing failure to obtain a majority. Another attempt to counter the argument was by Kelsen, who said that in order to get around this nullity as a sanction, you can use my odd proposition. Hart also points out that if a law without sanction is shown to be possible, then this argument and Austin's entire model disappears. He also says that laws which operate as orders backed by threats are fundamentally different from other types of laws, since only the former are designed to suppress activity viewed as negative. For example, there's a difference between a fine meant to deter people from driving above the speed limit and a tax whose purpose is simply to collect revenue. Now, Hart's criticism on the basis that firstly, Austin's single coercive model ignores the variety of laws and secondly, ignores the different purpose of laws as demonstrated by a variety of sanctions is rejected by Cottrell on the grounds that Austin was merely seeking to demonstrate characteristics familiar to all laws, not claim that all laws serve the same purpose. Laws repealing other ones were not laws in real sense since they commanded absolutely nothing. Now, for part two of this lecture on uh, Austin, 
please log on to lawprep101.com where you will be able to find other notes and summaries which will really aid to your learning.